funny thing. Either we don't want to think about doomsday or, or, or the civilization falling, or we want to obsess about it. Is it human nature to want to know when the end will come? I think we all want to know. We'd love to know how much time we have left. Ancient doomsday prophecies. Each world age was supposed to end in a destruction. I think the Maya were saying something about December 21st, 2012. Now prophecy collides with modern science. There's storms on the Earth of unprecedented proportion. No species lives forever. We are in a major extinction right now. Around the world, people are preparing. Every single person in America needs to be doing something to prepare for what's coming. What we fear will happen in 2012 is going to happen. This is Countdown to Apocalypse. 2012, a time of unprecedented change and turmoil throughout the world. Some are turning to ancient prophecy to foretell their fate. Perhaps no other prediction currently holds more power than the Maya calendar, with its looming end date of December 21st, 2012. What is the Maya 2012 thing about? It's a perfect storm. It's a coincidence of scientific uh, speculation. The ancient Maya predicted that the end of December 2012, specifically December 21st, 2012, would be a time of great reckoning for us, and they said that that would be because of the sun's behavior. The Maya were an ancient civilization that rose to prominence deep in the jungle of Central America. The ancient Maya lived between about 300 BC and 900 AD in the present nation of Guatemala and Belize and the adjoining parts of Mexico, Honduras, and El Salvador. With limited technology, they built great temples and mastered the mapping of the stars. By 800 AD, their population had grown to more than a million people in 6,000 cities. While they are known for their advanced writing system and meticulous record keeping, much of their knowledge was lost when this ancient civilization mysteriously vanished. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that surviving Maya texts began turning up in museums and the work of translation could begin. Then, in the 1960s, an ancient tablet referred to as Monument Six, or the Tortuguero Stone, was unearthed from an archeological site in southern Mexico. Inscribed on this tablet, a date when time seemingly runs out. December 21st, 2012. To many, this stone represents a chilling prophecy about the end of the world. However, some details from the stone remain shrouded in mystery. Right when it gets to the crucial part where it says what's going to happen, the stone is broken. We call this Murphy's Law of Epigraphy. But what we discern from the surviving portion of the tablet is that the Maya calculated December 21st, 2012 to be a critical point in human history. Their prophecy, in a nutshell, was that on December 21st, 2012, it would be like the birth of a new era. And like any other birth, it would be accompanied by joy, blood, and pain. Obsessed with the cycles of the sun, moon, and stars, the Mayan method for recording time has many modern-day scholars in awe. The Maya were not just astronomers, they were astrologers. And they weren't just mathematicians, they were numerologists. And they had fabulous ability to record things mathematically. They were great observers of the sky, observers of the stars, observers of the heavens and they made incredibly accurate calendars. They, they found a, a, a magic number, in a sense, that brings together all these different sky rhythms. And so it can be used for calculation purposes, but it also was used for interpretive purposes as well, which is astrology. The Maya believed the keys to human fate were held within the heavens. They used their keen astrological sense to predict events hundreds of years into the future, including the Spanish conquest of Mexico in 1519, 
and a revolution in communication which has been fully realized with the advent of the printing press and the World Wide Web. Because they were obsessed with time, there were some people that thought that maybe time was their religion. And the Maya's pursuit of tracking time was based on their understanding of celestial cycles and their impact upon the planet. They understood that patterns in the stars were closely linked to the patterns occurring on the Earth. This advanced knowledge makes their calendar unparalleled to this day. They would keep track of events and how many days elapsed between them. And they could calculate not only thousands of years, but millions of years in the future and the past. The Maya created many calendars to measure the cycles of astronomical events. The calendar, which ends on December 21st, 2012, is one that measures a cycle that started over 5,000 years ago. December 21st, 2012 is the end date of a 5,125-year block of time called the Long Count. The origin date of the Long Count calendar is in the year 3114 BC, a period of dramatic transition for human society. The beginnings of Stonehenge occur around that time. The beginnings of the Old Kingdom in Egypt occur at that time. There are a number of uh, events worldwide that seem to have their origins at that point. So something must have gone on globally. Around 3100, 3200 BC, there is the indication that something happened. It may have been a solar outburst, but something happened. Now, is this just coincidental that it correlates pretty closely with the start of the Mayan calendar? I don't know, but when I see a correlation like that, I have to suspect that there is something to it. There are many theories about what happened to prompt the emergence of modern civilization. But whatever occurred, it clearly stretched beyond the border of the ancient Maya world. It was probably climate. It appears that there were uh, some fairly rapid climate change events that occurred then. My argument would be that climate change is a primary driver of the evolution of human societies. Global climate change, a hot button issue for our time, may have had an even greater impact on the ancient world. And while the start date of the long count may shed light on past events on Earth, the end date, December 21st, 2012, heralds an even rarer coincidence one that hasn't taken place for 26,000 years. Something that's very interesting is that the sun on December 21st, 2012, will be aligned with the Milky Way galaxy. On this day, the sun, the Earth, and the plane of the galaxy, the, the galactic equator, line up. And the fact that it happens on the winter solstice, December 21st, a lot of people, particularly astrologers, have said this is an important alignment. Going back in time 26,000 years, the world was a very different place. 26,000 years ago, when you had the same situation, you are talking about the height of the last ice age. This alignment is a unique point in time, a unique point in history. And if the Mayans could figure this out and develop a calendar that allowed them to end this world age on this significant point where there is this alignment, I mean, that just shows how incredible they were. 26,000 years ago, the Earth began dramatically warming up. Is the galactic alignment to blame? And what does that mean for December 2012? There are those who believe that an alignment of the planets can cause the sun's surface to be perturbed and there to be explosions and things that result. And these have an incredible effect on the surface of the Earth, heating up the atmosphere, changing climatic conditions. I believe this had a very profound influence and effect on ancient civilizations, even to the point of essentially wiping out certain ancient civilizations and setting humanity into essentially dark ages. The sun does seem to be going into a period of instability. Solar activity is ramping up. Does this tie in with the galactic alignment? 
we are coming to the end of a cycle. We're coming, as they called it, to the end of a world age. This has happened in the past. Each world age was supposed to end in a different type of destruction. And I believe the Mayans were saying to us, this is happening again. Interestingly, there is yet a third cycle that will reach its peak on December 21st, 2012. And this may be the most dangerous one of all. Every 11 years, the sun goes through one cycle from maximum to maximum, meaning more sunspots and therefore more solar activity and storms that issue from the sun and might hit us. When solar activity ramps up, bursts of energy surge out from the sun's surface that can directly impact the Earth. On December 21st, 2012, just as the Mayan world age comes to an end, the sun will be entering its most violent period. We're just starting to understand that the sun is incredibly unstable from a geological point of view. We should be careful, we should pay attention to it because it could have real ramifications for our modern society if there is a major solar outburst. Behavior of the sun ended 2012, both from contemporary science and ancient mind prophecy, points to some potentially civilization-altering events. It's enough for me. The countdown to apocalypse is on. And with ancient doomsday prophecies and modern science colliding, everyday people are preparing for the worst. People come to Sigma 3 because they're worried that something's around the corner and they want to be prepared and make sure that their family is taken care of. We train people for worst case scenarios, basically training to keep your ass alive. And now we have fire. There's always something happening. There's always turmoil, which in my mind makes it even more important to be prepared. So can you guys uh, start looking around for some bait? We want to find grasshoppers, crickets, worms. An asteroid strike, earthquakes, uh, floods, uh, you know, massive volcanic eruptions. He's coming right out. We have to get him. Can you pin him down with that, Robert? Watch him. I absolutely love snake. It's great fish bait. You can actually saute this up with a little olive oil and some onions. It's absolutely fantastic. Security out here is as important as fire or water. All right, we can't have shelter, water, fire, food, and not have security. People are going to come take it. This is the kind of training that civilians need to be getting to ensure that them and their families stay alive. You can literally sleep in one of these shelters down to 20 below with no sleeping bag and blizzard-type conditions, and it will keep you warm. Desperate people do all kinds of sort of crazy things, and it's best just to get away from that environment. We are always going to have food that we can procure out here and eat well and, and make sure that our family's well fed, no matter what happens in the world. All right, there we go. You know, civilizations fall. It's, it's history. Things aren't as secure as we would like them to be. And that's, that's just humanity, in my opinion. As the clock ticks down to December 21st, 2012, the end point of the ancient Maya calendar, many are preparing for uncertain times to come. But the vast majority of us continue to live our lives entirely unaware of the looming danger in our skies. You know, the last thing you need to do is to worry about the sun. We all have enough to just get through the day, family, finances, enough politics to make you sick. And then I went on the NASA and European Space Agency websites and saw that the sun indeed had been acting up over the last century, century and a half, and particularly over the last few decades. And the only thing that people could agree upon was that the next climax of this behavior would be in 2012. All of a sudden, I find I'm worrying about the sun. Yeah, the sun, like, like most other stars, uh, has its own magnetic field. When you look at the sun, you see the surface of the sun, and you sometimes see very dark spots. 
these dark spots, I can release energy very rapidly. And that leads to two phenomena. One phenomenon is what's called a solar flare. That's basically a very sudden brightening on a certain spot on the sun. The other phenomenon, and that's not been known for so long, only for about 20 years, is what's called a coronal mass ejection. So it's basically an explosion on the surface on the sun where a lot of energy is released. And that energy slings out a lot of plasma, a lot of material from the sun that eventually then travels towards the Earth. These CMEs, or coronal mass ejections, send powerful waves of plasma energy off into space. If any of those waves were aimed at the Earth, there could be disastrous consequences. The shock wave of particles that the explosion caused hits us in less than an hour. So we get hit by a shock wave of particles in advance, and then the coronal mass ejection, or CME itself, arrives a couple days later and hopefully bounces off the Earth's protective magnetic field. But what if a coronal mass ejection is strong enough to penetrate Earth's protective magnetic shield? You wouldn't notice much at first. Your cell phone probably would stop working. The electricity in your home would follow shortly. Unlike a localized power outage caused by bad weather on Earth, the damage from a coronal mass ejection could destroy electronics of every kind. Cars, airplanes, computers, and more could all experience irreversible damage, and the devices that survive could be left powerless as the entire electrical power grid is potentially fried by solar radiation. In this case, the transformers, which are the nodal points which hold the power grid together, would get burnt out. And replacing transformers is not easy. The biggest ones weigh over 100 tons, and there's a three-year waiting list on the world market for them. No electricity means not just no telecom. means, in many cases, no water and fuel because the pumps are electric. No refrigeration. No fresh food, no medicine, very limited law enforcement and military security, no banking for months or years. This is a, a crisis of, of fantastic proportion. We are incredibly dependent upon electronic equipment. With a major solar outburst, a lot of that delicate electronic equipment could be damaged. We know that this will happen because it has happened. There was the Carrington event in 1859. There was a solar flare at that time that was witnessed, actually. Carrington was a solar physicist who observed the sun, and he also observed a few things for the first time. One was that there was an explosion on the sun, what we call a solar flare. He observed that, and he also observed that about two days later, there was a geomagnetic storm on the Earth. When the solar outbursts of the Carrington event struck in 1859, Telegraph systems, the most sophisticated electronic technology of the time, were knocked out. That was much larger than anything that we have observed in modern times. Some people have speculated that a storm like that, if it happened today, could, for example, seriously disrupt the power grid. If that were to hit today, it would probably knock out our electrical power grid for months and years. I think it would shake up the world a lot. In the years since the Carrington event, mankind has become entirely dependent on electricity and the technology it powers. Without it, civilization would come to a crashing halt. We are laid bare to this, this terrible, terrible threat. And if we have to go without electricity for months or years, civilization will fall. People say, Larry, isn't that like being in a pre-electric age? I say, no, much worse, because those folks knew how to live without electricity. We don't. Well, this is a profoundly serious vulnerability, and we will get hit, maybe very soon. And the Carrington event is not the only time that solar activity has shaken our world. On March 13, 1989, the entire Canadian province of Quebec experienced a 12-hour blackout caused by a CME. And in 2003, South Africa was also rocked by the effects of a coronal mass ejection. 2003 event came on Halloween, you know, trick or treat, and knocked out 14 transformers and disabled the power grid in uh, South Africa. Its electricity supply was crippled for a couple of years because of this. This kind of event is gonna happen more and more. And certainly, what we fear will happen in 2012 is gonna happen. We're living in a very fragile world. Our technology is keeping the lights on. The slightest glitch in our technology and a whole year's crops be destroyed, that'd be a disaster. 
And if we have a two-week power outage in New York City, oh, it's going to be the end of the world in America. Unfortunately, the periodic cycle of the sun is making this possibility more likely now than ever. And like the Maya, who understood the sun's power, modern man is about to experience it firsthand. The sun is, at this point, ramping up again and becoming more active. That's the solar climax, when the sun will be at its stormiest and, and wildest and most tumultuous. We're seeing more evidence of solar flares. The sun is showing unusual activity. The sun is having a breakdown. It's behaving as though it were ill or crazy. If we had something along the lines of the solar outburst that we see at the end of the last ice age, we really don't know what to expect. But what we can predict is that on December 21st, 2012, our solar system will be in exactly the same position and alignment that it was in 26,000 years ago, when the Earth underwent cataclysmic climate changes at the end of the last ice age. I think it's foolish not to be prepared to deal with things that we know from history and prehistory have happened before and therefore could happen again. Scientists now realize how damaging solar outbursts can be for modern life. But a more frightening scenario is still to come, one in which these same solar storms ignite a chain reaction on Earth, fundamentally altering our climate, geography, and world as we know it. As December 21st, 2012 approaches, and our sun enters its most turbulent cycle, Scientists are all too aware of the devastation that solar storms can wage upon the Earth. Storms so severe that they can disable our power grids and paralyze our planet. People around the world are heeding the warnings and preparing for the worst. Items like these little saws right here are completely essential. You know, one of the things that we teach is that when you want to pack equipment, it's much better to pack tools and carry that kind of weight than it is to carry a bunch of food and water, which is things that we can procure from the land. I think something big is coming. I think uh, most people around the country feel it. No one can really put their finger on it, and people are trying to figure out what it could be. You've been shown shelters, water procurement, edible plants, medicinal plants, and now this, the, the use of a firearm, that's another foundational skill. When people are put in a situation like if the lights and the electricity and their form of transportation goes down, they get really desperate. And it would be best to have already some preparations and get out to the wild places as fast as you can away from all that. So as people start fleeing the city, they're going to start out pretty normal. But after a few days, they really start getting desperate. So the people coming to your camp are going to be potentially more and more dangerous every single day. So this would be a great place for an observation post because this is the most likely route of entry for someone. When I come back here, it's right on the trail. Just start building this up a little more, right? You're going to want to let your weapon rest pretty naturally, set on your body in the general direction that it's going to be facing, right? It needs to be something that's fast, so if you get surprised, you can just come right up with it. Don't ever have it more than an arm's length away. OK. What I'm trying to do for people is just get them prepared and ready to deal with the reality of post-disaster. And the reality is people are victimizing one another. In these final days before December 21st, 2012, buzz about the Mayan prophecy is heating up. People around the world are preparing for difficult days ahead before it's too late. This is the generation when we need to be aware, we need to be prudent. We need to be paying attention to what's happening in the skies, what's happening on Earth, what changes may be occurring. And in the same way the Maya looked to the heavens to forecast their future, modern man is now doing the same. Since our sun will be emitting high levels of activity at the end of the year, experts are concerned about the impact that these solar storms may have upon the planet. And now, just when we need protection the most, a rare and dangerous planetary transformation may be underway. Some people say that the magnetic poles will reverse. And the magnetism of the Earth is what protects us 
More than 600 miles above the Earth's surface lies a magnetic field known as the magnetosphere, extending thousands of miles into space. It protects us from solar radiation and cosmic radiation. Held in place by the magnetic anchors of our North and South Poles, the magnetosphere is Earth's only defense against dangerous solar radiation. There are studies that indicate the field of Earth, the magnetic field of Earth, has been declining over the last 100, 150 years or so. So there's been a lot of concern in some circles that the magnetosphere, if it's affected, if there are put holes in the magnetosphere, that could allow radiation and particles down, all the way down potentially to the surface of the Earth. One possible cause of the weakening magnetic field may be a process known as pole shift, a natural geological phenomenon in which the magnetic poles of the Earth slowly migrate. However, some worry that this is a sign that the Earth is undergoing something much more troublesome, a full pole reversal in which the North and South Poles actually switch place. The net effect for us is that the, the Earth's magnetic field weakens and the protective character of it diminishes. It happens periodically in the Earth. And it usually takes, they say, two to 3,000 years to complete. The consequence of this pole reversal and subsequent collapse of the Earth's magnetosphere would prove catastrophic. For humans, this could lead to radical increases in cancer for the planet, rapid climate change, and massive seismic activity. The implications if, if we're going through a pole shift are many. We are more exposed to CMEs and to solar radiation, meaning our, our power grid is that much more vulnerable to being blown out. Animals depend on the Earth's magnetic field as kind of an internal GPS system. They use the magnetic field to navigate. If the creatures of Earth lose their ability to navigate properly, it could have serious repercussions for their migration patterns, disrupting the ecosystem in ways we can't even imagine. For us, for our maintaining our civilization, our daily life, it could be terrible. The idea that a polar reversal happens is actually geologically supported. Scientists have calculated that a pole reversal usually occurs every 300,000 years. However, the Earth hasn't experienced a pole reversal in nearly 800,000 years. We are long overdue for a polar reversal. I would say that certainly the magnetic field is weakening and the North Pole is traveling very quickly. So something is happening. In fact, scientists have now tracked the migration of the North Pole, which is moving toward Russia at a rate of 40 miles per year, accelerating 30% in the last decade alone, giving proof to the idea that a polar reversal may very well be underway, just as the storm cycle of the sun kicks into high gear. You want to cross your fingers about something? Hope that this is normal and it doesn't indicate that there's any pole shift. It's scary to think of the timing. As the Earth's magnetic field deteriorates, the solar activity accelerates. It's just bad luck. Without the protection of our magnetosphere, the life-giving sun becomes a ticking time bomb. There are so many things going on right now in our country and in the world that it, would, it wouldn't take very much of a spark to ignite any one of those into a large-scale type of situation. That's why I'm here. You know, I, I want to be prepared for anything. With the countdown to apocalypse in full swing, preparedness could be the difference between life and death. I mean, these are real-life issues that you're only going to work out after trying it. You don't want your first time to be real life. He's going to push the trigger, and he's dead. You know, a lot of people accuse you of being paranoid. I say, I'm not paranoid. I'm not afraid of anything. I don't do what I do because I'm scared. It's the exact opposite. I do it because I don't have to fear now. As the clock ticks down to the end of 2012, and the Mayan calendar comes to an end, a rare convergence of celestial cycles foretold by the ancient Maya has some modern scientists taking notice. On December 21st, 
a once in every 26,000 year galactic alignment will take place. The last time this alignment occurred, the Earth's temperature rose dramatically at the end of the last ice age. These planetary events coincide with our sun's most volatile cycle when it will be throwing off waves of harmful radiation that can have disastrous effects. And all at a time when Earth's magnetic defense shield may be compromised. The sun in many ways controls events on Earth in ways we never imagined. In late August, early September 2005, it was one of the wildest weeks in the history of recorded solar activity, the second heaviest week of solar storms to hit the Earth. The sun is going wild. There's storms on the sun of unprecedented proportion. There's storms on the Earth, Katrina, Rita, Wilma. Storms on the sun, storms on the Earth. Was there a connection? As the Earth is barraged by record-breaking storms and heat waves, scientists are worried about the possible domino effect that could be triggered by solar radiation, starting with the melting of Earth's polar ice caps. One forecast is that by the end of the 21st century, the Greenland ice sheet will melt, and maybe the West Antarctic ice sheet. If both of those go, we've got a 40-foot rise in sea level. This melting of glaciers, which are miles thick, releases pressure from the surface of the Earth and then causes volcanic and earthquake activity. So it's sort of, if you put your hand on a sofa cushion and then you take your hand away, the, the cushion's gonna rebound. Is the melting of the polar ice caps behind the string of devastating earthquakes that recently struck Japan, Chile, and left over 100,000 dead in Haiti? At the same time, where is this water going? It's being melted, it's being vaporized, it's going into the atmosphere, so it has to come down again. So we have now incredible rains. It's like a chain of events. Our dominoes, one falls over, hits another one, causes that to fall over. Solar storms leading to the collapse of the power grid, setting America back to the 1700s. Degradation of the magnetosphere destroying the protective layer between Earth and the sun, global warming, causing droughts, extinctions, even earthquakes and volcanoes. Is there no end to this chain of destruction? It's this series of events triggering other events, triggering other events, catastrophe. With these great forces of nature aligned against us, it seems fair to ask, is there any hope? About 30% of global warming is attributable to the hyperactivity of the sun over the last century and a half, and particularly over the last few decades. It doesn't negate our need to curb greenhouse gas emissions. If anything, it makes it more important to me because we cannot control what the sun's doing, right? Which means we have to redouble our efforts to, to, to control what we can. But despite our best efforts, the end of life on Earth may come sooner rather than later, whether we like it or not. We're in what's uh, being called the sixth extinction. I mean, extinction events occur. Uh, the last really big one was 65 million years ago when a, an asteroid about 10 kilometers in diameter hit Mexico and basically took out the dinosaurs. The crater from the impact that killed the dinosaurs lies just off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, coincidentally the backyard of the ancient Maya. The Maya. I feel, but certainly can't prove it scientifically, that they inherited some sense of the possibility of catastrophe that could be awakened by some signal. During each of the previous five extinctions, 50% or more of all animal species disappeared. In fact, 98% of all animal life that ever lived on Earth is now extinct. According to scientists, 50,000 species now disappear every year a rate hundreds of times faster than the historical average. Humans cutting down forests, polluting waters, burning fossil fuels, changing climate. And we are now living in a time when species are going extinct at a very rapid rate due to human, well, essentially human infestation. When a species vanishes from the food chain, its predators starve and its prey overpopulate. This could result in insect swarms, agricultural collapse, 
and a shockwave of global famine. And what's left behind could be a desolate wasteland, one modern Americans may find hard to imagine. Cultures and societies can, uh, you know, reach a peak and then collapse. So it's hard to say what will happen. And the very destiny of modern man may be mirroring the fate of the Maya, whose civilization suffered a massive demise around 900 AD. Everything collapsed. It was so bad that they abandoned their cities. The great Maya civilization, who were so in tune with cycles, maybe missed the one cycle, the climate cycle, that killed them. They were in a fragile ecosystem that they stressed to its limit, and there was a bad drought or something that caused a tipping point, and these people suffered collapses that were cataclysmic. And the cause of the Maya downfall may hold a chilling lesson for our modern world. The Maya, like other human cultures, ruthlessly consume their resources and eventually have to pay the cost for that. They overforested and underplanned and overpopulated, and you know that's that's clearly a parable for us these days. Will mankind heed the lesson of the Mayan collapse before it's too late? History shows that the mighty Maya civilization credited by some for foretelling the end of the world, failed to anticipate the threats that destroyed its own. It must have been tremendous. It must have been cataclysmic. You don't abandon a city lightly. And they abandoned 6,000 cities. 600 years later, the Spanish conquistadors sailed in, laying waste to the cultural remnants of this once great society. Their libraries were destroyed. Few books survived. Literature was collected up and burned. They destroyed everything because they called it lies of the devil. But in the eyes of most scholars, the Spanish merely completed a destructive process the ancient Maya set off hundreds of years earlier. I think they might have fallen victim to a, a cycle that led to the desertification of their, their territory. It must have been a time of tremendous starvation and was probably caused by messing with their environment and just filling up too many people on the landscape and not having a backup, not having a cushion. I think that an important warning that we should take from this is that we're doing the same thing the Maya did. We're stressing our environment beyond its limits and we don't have any wiggle room, we don't have any cushion. Global population has nearly doubled in the last 50 years, increasing the risk of disease, global famine, and the competition for resources that can lead to war and genocide. What we're doing is we're overpopulating. We're basically fulfilling our biotic potential like all other organisms, and we're reproducing as much as we can. Our behavior is dangerous. And that's not all. According to the International Energy Agency, the world's potential for oil production peaked in 2006. As a result, the ever-increasing future demand will lead to higher energy costs in dollars and lives. I would think that the 21st century is going to make or break the human species in one form or another. But what about the Maya prophecy of 2012? Recent findings have cast doubt on whether December 21st of this year truly represents the end of our world. Archaeologists have recently excavated new Maya calendars in Guatemala that seem to calculate time beyond 2012. The discovery has many relieved, but it has yet to answer the question on minds everywhere. What significance did the Maya really see in the December 21st date? And what does it mean for us today? December 21st, 2012, I see that as more I'll call it a metaphor as an indication that something could be occurring. Maybe it's the beginning of something that's going to happen. I think they did us a great favor. They gave us a head start. They pointed us in a direction that we needed to look. They said the behavior of the sun is going to cause something major at the end of December 2012. Whether or not we believe in the Maya prophecies, whether or not you look at them allegorically or literally. After 2012, after this year, we're in for some serious pain. No one will know when the banks are gonna collapse again, but they will collapse. No one knows 
when the gas is going to get shut off, but there will be times and places where the gas is shut off. These things are going to happen. We're in for some nasty times. And perhaps the most serious threat hanging over us today is the disruption of energy that makes modern life possible. Electricity suckles the civilization. And yet, for some reason, we have not protected our electricity supply. We're, we're looking for a comeuppance. We're looking for a slap upside the head. The odds, are, to me, are better than 50-50 that within our lifetime, the power grid will go down. We have to get a sustainable society going. It seems very hard to do. But if we don't do it, we're going to pay the price. At the very least, it's going to cost a lot of lives. And in the meantime, make some plans. Go off grid. Have backup systems that are not vulnerable. Do some work. Minimize the risk. Minimize the damage. So that we're not, we're not left flailing like, you know, electrocuted fish on the dock. This happens to be the water hemlock plant. Bar none, this plant will kill you deader than a doornail if you eat it. People who are going off grid and taking their destiny into their own hands, there's a lot to admire about them, and not only just sort of words of praise, but acts of imitation. The future of life on Earth is grand and wonderful and a many splendored thing, to borrow a phrase from John Donne. The future of our civilization ain't looking so good. I think we're riding for a fall. If human civilization is truly on the ropes, the world may soon be divided between the prepared and the dead. Back in Arkansas, the teachers and students at Sigma 3 Survival School have made their choice and are busy preparing for the future we hope we'll never see. So this shelter will essentially help you to live longer amounts of time in the wilderness. For survivalists, this is definitely a mansion. This is going to be a lot better than any kind of little lean-to or basic shelter that most people throw together. Building a structure like this can really help you to appreciate when you have the right kind of survival training skills, what you can really do and how comfortable that you can be. It's not just about surviving. When you come out here, you need to thrive to have the right psychological state of mind to, to be out here longer term. I do believe in being prepared. Sigma 3 is teaching me how to take care of myself, to be more self-sufficient, to work as a team. Every single person in America needs to be doing something to prepare for what's coming because you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that trouble's right around the corner. Nothing is permanent. A lesson passed across the miles and centuries from an ancient Mesoamerican tribe with its eyes on the stars to modern-day Americans prepping to survive in a broken society. What will the world look like after December 21st, 2012? Time will tell. As the cycles of the heavens align and the Maya world age comes to an end. For nearly 2,000 years, the Book of Revelation has stood as the New Testament's blueprint of doom. The Book of Revelation is really an outline for the end of the world. It's the great gory scenario of the battle between good and evil. Revelation foretells the coming of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, heralding the end of days on Earth. We will see the arrival of an evil leader or antichrist. He's the best con man there ever was. Disease. Plagues will kill a quarter of the world's population. Famine. People are going to start going hungry. These will last about 25 years. And global war leading to our last judgment. The War of Armageddon will take us to a primal world of violence, blood, decimation, and nuclear warfare. As science and prophecy collide. We could have another pandemic tomorrow. There are many scenarios that could turn things bad very quickly. Concerned citizens are preparing. I've got a medical surgical kit here. And again, the Bible talks about this. Genesis was the beginning. Revelation is the end of the world. This is Countdown 
to Apocalypse. Every Sunday around the Christian world, church pews reverberate with the dark end times prophecy of the book of Revelation, the last and most explosive book of the New Testament. When we see the end of times in the Revelation of John, we see the forces of evil, the devil, and the forces of good, the creator, the sanctifier, the giver of all life in the name of Jesus. The book of Revelation has a profound appeal whether or not you're a believer. It's the, the, the great gory scenario of, of the battle between good and evil that has shaped everyone's consciousness about what the end times will be. The book of Revelation has introduced the world to the concepts of Armageddon, the mark of the beast, and the word that's become synonymous with the end of the world itself, apocalypse. The word apocalypse People associate it with the end times and judgment, but really it, it's a transliteration of a Greek word that means the revealing, the revelation. The book of Revelation was written by John the Revelator during a time of imperial persecution of, of Christians in the Roman Empire around AD 96, toward the end of the reign of the Emperor Domitian. The first decades after Jesus' crucifixion were a time of grave danger for the early Christians. Many were forced to flee their homes or risk death. John wrote the book of Revelation after he was exiled to a cave in Patmos, Greece. He spent two years in the cave, saw some really hoary visions, put them all together. While the power of John the Revelator's vision is beyond dispute, the writer's true intention has been forever shrouded in mystery. There's always been the question of how to interpret the book of Revelation. Is the book of Revelation a crystal ball? Or is it a magnifying glass? Or is it a mirror? Or is it a window? Some would say all of the above. Whether originally meant as prophecy or allegory, to millions around the world, Revelation stands today as a divinely inspired roadmap for the end of days. The book of Revelation conveys exactly what's going to happen to the world in stages in the end times. To kick off these last days on earth, Revelation states that Jesus Christ will open a series of seals, unleashing the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The arrival of each of these horsemen will bring forth a unique and horrible judgment upon mankind that few will survive. There would be destruction, there will be plagues, there will be wars, there will become a time of tribulation like has never been before and will never be again since. And it all begins with the arrival of the white horse. In Revelation chapter 6, the Lord himself commands from heaven that this whole thing starts. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The rider on the white horse represents the Antichrist, the world charismatic political leader. Scripture says he'll be the absolute deceiver, the father of all lies, and he will deceive the entire world into thinking otherwise. Not everybody who rides on a white horse is a good guy. It sounds like, dun, 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 here comes Jesus. I don't think so. I don't think so. The Antichrist seeks to destroy God's people in an effort to clear the way for setting himself up as, as God. The emerging Antichrist's first step will be to unite the planet under his reign. You'll see the Antichrist taking over planet Earth, a one world government, a one world economic system, a one world religion. With Europe united and globalization reshaping our political world, are these times already approaching? 
I think it's important that people understand that this idea of a one world government uh, is not far off. The one world government and the one world economic system is literally being assembled before our very eyes. And you and I in our lifetime are going to see a world currency and a global government. There'll be a one world authoritarian system that won't look too bad initially, but then after three and a half years, the Antichrist will reveal himself as the devil. But how is it that mankind will be so easily seduced? According to believers, the rise of the Antichrist will be sped along by deterioration in global conditions, leaving us powerless to resist. The Antichrist must create a need for his appearance. And he's doing that by means of his human agents, by crashing the global economy, killing the dollar, making everyone desperate. Can't take no more! Can't take no more! In December 2007, the world entered an economic spiral that has come to be called the Great Recession, with financial calamities like bank bailouts, housing bubbles, and the European sovereign debt crisis. Some believe the stage has been set for the Antichrist's arrival. People set the stage with economic collapse, with food shortages, with war and rumors of war, with every kind of disorder and chaos imaginable. And in this time of global despair, this charismatic leader will give people hope. The Antichrist will have a supernatural ability to win people over, to get people to like him. A lot of people have this misconception of the Antichrist as being some dark occult figure, you know, with horns coming out of his head. None of that is true. He's the rider on the white horse. He's, the good, he, he's a good guy. His charisma will be so powerful that he will have people in the palm of his hands. He's the best con man there ever was. While some might dismiss the white horse prophecy as biblical fantasy, this would not be the first time a ruthless tyrant has charmed his way into the seat of power during trying times, only to doom his people to destruction. We could go out history and we'll see that mankind has this desperate need to be led by a powerful, charismatic leader. There's this desire for fascism. There's a desire for a dictatorial, authoritarian government. Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, each was revered in his own time. And combined, these three men were responsible for the deaths of over 100 million civilians. But these bloodthirsty dictators may have just been a prelude. The Antichrist will make Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy. In these troubled times, could the reign of a modern Antichrist be at hand? The reality is that the Antichrist is most likely alive and among us right now. There can be no doubt that the Antichrist beast man of the apocalypse is alive today, none, none whatsoever. All the signs are there. If the Antichrist is already among us, life on Earth, however long it lasts, is about to take an ugly turn. In the face of the Book of Revelation's end-time prophecies, many are turning to prayer to steel themselves for God's judgment. But others, like Ray Gano, are preparing to keep themselves alive, no matter what these last days have in store. Folks, I'm gonna break it to you. We are living in the last days of the last days, and you know what? We are living in perilous times. Ray Gano is a former TSA agent who 10 years ago became a born-again Christian. Inspired by the Book of Revelation's doomsday scenarios, Ray began operating a Bible prophecy website and preparing for the worst. What people need to understand is that our environment, our society is going downhill fast. And it ain't gonna get better, it's gonna get worse. We need to have that urgency within us to start 
preparing, start learning, start doing whatever we can so that when the storm comes, we are able to weather that storm. 2012 is a time of great upheaval around the globe. Today is a time of uncertainty. People are very insecure. We are experiencing economic crisis. Everywhere you look, this planet is being shaken violently and sociologically and economically. And according to the Book of Revelation's prophecy of the white horse, times like these make us increasingly vulnerable to the charms of an evil charismatic leader or antichrist. Throughout history, the antichrist label has been placed upon countless political, religious, and business leaders. The famous prophet of the Middle Ages, Nostradamus, saw a future where humanity is menaced by a series of these figures. Nostradamus wrote a lot of quatrains about individuals he referred to as antichrists. The first one was Napoleon Bonaparte, the second one is Adolf Hitler, and the third one is yet to arrive. But one of the most enduring objects of Antichrist speculation resides not in a palace of government, but at the Vatican. Starting with Martin Luther, John Calvin, all these fellas, without a doubt, held that the Pope was the Antichrist, that the papacy, the institution of the papacy, really represented the Antichrist system. If you look at the claims of many of the popes, they put themselves in the role of God. And um, this is what the Bible predicts the Antichrist will do. It talks about he will exalt himself above God and claim to be God. Many popes did just that. By the time the world agrees on the Antichrist's identity, it may be too late. According to believers, the ancient Maya who predicted a global cataclysm on December 21st, 2012, are not alone in suggesting that doomsday is coming in our time. The Bible says that we're approaching the end of the first 6,000 years of human history. Now, what will happen at the end of 6,000 years of human history is the end of days, the end of the age, where we will transition until that final 1,000 year period called the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Watch and expect for Jesus to return. My Lord could come today, hallelujah, amen? This could be the day Christ could return. But according to the book of Revelation, between now and the second coming, the world is in for unprecedented turmoil and unspeakable pain. Every horrific thing you can think of is going to be started when that white horse leaves the, leaves the gate. Is a modern antichrist ready to storm onto the scene and bring mankind to its knees? It'll be not just a representative of Satan, as we've seen in the past. This man will be the actual devil himself. Unfortunately for humanity, the arrival of the antichrist is just the beginning. Three more of the Book of Revelation's apocalyptic horsemen are still in the gates. Next on the scene is the rider on the pale horse, promising to infect our world with a global disease pandemic. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was falling close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword famine and plague. The pale horse represents disease and pestilence that will kill uh, a quarter of the world's population. Could this worldwide outbreak of disease promised by the pale horse prophecy, leaving billions dead in its wake, come to pass today? We're always at a risk for pandemic. Pandemics have the potential to kill a large portion of the population. There have been some diseases that have been global killers. Cholera has killed hundreds of millions. AIDS since 1981 probably killed about 25 million people also. Biblically speaking, we know that in the last days that we will see death, we will see pestilence, we will see disease rise.
perhaps history's most notorious pandemic was the bubonic plague, or Black Death, which ravaged Europe in the mid-1300s. We suspect about 100 million people died during that outbreak. Estimates about 30 to 60 percent of the population. The plague didn't earn the title Black Death just because of its mortality rate. Those stricken with the plague experienced gruesome symptoms, blackening of the skin due to gangrene, and swollen boils called buboes that appeared in the neck, armpit, or groin. These were accompanied by severe fever and stomach pain, and typically claimed the victim's life within a week. It took about maybe 150 years for the population to come back up again. The Black Death is a great example of really how devastating an infectious disease can be to a naive population. But as devastating as the Black Death pandemic was, some fear that future disease outbreaks could be even worse. When you look at the Black Death, uh, it killed maybe one in three Europeans. Now, this was in a, an era where most people didn't travel out of their village. Imagine a plague like that hitting now in the days of air travel. The real problem that we face with a global pandemic is how quickly uh, it would spread around the world. If you get one person infected traveling through a major world airport, then everyone at the airport is at risk of infection. They uh, spread the disease to the four corners of the world. The Black Death has been mostly relegated to the history books, but there is another, more common disease that has killed millions in the past, and whose worst outbreak may still be to come. For the influenza 1918 H1N1 outbreak, somewhere from 50 to 130 million deaths worldwide, given our population now, which is about threefold, would be somewhere between 150 million to 450 million deaths. And the next big flu outbreak can happen at any time, with deadly consequences straight out of Revelation's dark prophecy. Flu viruses don't go, OK, well, two years ago we had a pandemic. We can sort of wait another 10 to 20 years. So we could have another pandemic tomorrow, or we could have another pandemic in another 20 years. It's completely unknown. While modern science has improved our defense against some infectious diseases, new vulnerabilities have emerged. There's no doubt that globalization is a key factor. And thanks to globalization, somebody could develop a novel disease. And within 18 to 24 hours, it could be anywhere else in the world. Ironically, the most lethal disease would be one where it doesn't kill you straight away, where actually the incubation period is quite slow, because you'd be infected and you wouldn't realize it. And you'd be walking around perfectly healthy for days. And it's that period where you might be taking a trip, you might be getting on an airplane. Uh, you could infect millions of people in that way before you even knew you were sick. An insidious infection festers undetected until it has spread to the four corners of the globe, resulting in the deaths of billions. A single unchecked sneeze could be all it takes for Revelation's grim prophecy to become a reality. But the horror doesn't end there. With the countdown to apocalypse underway, born-again prepper Ray Gano has begun stockpiling medicine for when the book of Revelation's pale horse prophecy comes to pass. The swine flu came through a couple years ago and, and literally shut our town down. And so we learned in a pandemic, the, the medicines and everything came off the shelves pretty fast. Everything was just bought up. We've used these emergency situations to learn from. I've got a, a wound treatment, so I've got a, a, a medical surgical kit here. And again, the Bible talks about this. I mean, there's crazy illnesses coming about. Biblically speaking, we know that in the last days that we will see death, we will see pestilence, we will see disease rise. According to the book of Revelation's four horsemen prophecy, the pale rider of pestilence 
is set to spread a lethal plague across the globe. But while some people believe this outbreak will be an especially virulent strain of the flu, others look to a more sinister scenario. I am absolutely convinced that the disease and pestilence associated with the pale horse is man-made biological warfare. There's a long history of biologic warfare. When you think about the phrase poisoning the well, the first episodes of biologic warfare probably refer to retreating armies that threw something in wells to make sure that people couldn't use that water uh, afterwards. Even during the French and Indian War, uh, there were attempts to get uh, blankets that uh, had been used by soldiers who died of smallpox uh, to uh, Native Americans. Biological weapons got to be, I think, of more interest toward the late 19th, early 20th century. One of the most notorious uses of bio-warfare was at the hands of Japanese Unit 731 during World War II. Stationed and occupied Manchuria, Unit 731 purposefully infected both local civilians and prisoners of war with cholera, anthrax, and the plague through forced injections, distributing infected candy, and spreading plague-infected fleas that killed thousands. And threats of another bioweapons attack are still very much alive today through the work of international terror groups. There are all sorts of threats from biological terrorism. They could be anthrax, it could be botulism, it could be smallpox, it could be almost any biologic agent. Since many of the agents are available within the atmosphere and the environment, somebody could take these organisms, produce them, and then disseminate them in a community and cause deliberate illness. The prospects of uh, biological warfare are imminent. I believe that that biological virus has already been designed, and it's already here. The question is, which one uh, will they use? If the United States does fall victim to a major bioterror attack, how will we respond? In 2001, the US government ran an exercise called Dark Winter, simulating the effect of a smallpox attack on Oklahoma City. The test revealed that the American government and health system were insufficiently prepared to handle such an outbreak and had only enough vaccine to protect 5% of the public. It's estimated that one million Americans would have died within weeks. This apocalyptic world promised by the Book of Revelation has now suffered both the arrival of the Antichrist and devastating disease or bioterror. But the pain doesn't end there. Yet another harbinger of doom promises desperation and slow death. The rider on the black horse. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. The black horse essentially represents famine and food shortages. And it's going to result in the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Famine has proven devastating to even the sturdiest civilizations, such as ancient Rome and the Maya. Even with the advance of technology, it continues to menace our planet in more recent times. You go back to the Irish potato famine, uh, early 1800s, when maybe a million people uh, died, but another million people emigrated, were forced out of their homes and the country because the situation was so bad. The Chinese famine, maybe as many as 40 million people dying. In the mid-80s, uh, Ethiopia faced a large-scale famine, multiple-year drought. Maybe a million people died there. As lethal as these regionalized famines were, ominous signs today suggest that the future will produce a famine that grips the entire globe. The number of countries today experiencing food shortages is, is definitely higher than it was just a couple of decades ago. We're looking at a global famine unparalleled in world history. Up to 20% of the world's population is 
unable to get enough food on a daily basis. At today's population levels, that places the number of hungry people at over one billion. And that many hungry people could turn the world into a powder keg. Once you start talking about roughly one billion people unable or un unsure of where the next meal is going to come from, it's the fear factor that kicks in, and fear is irrational. So you get a breakdown of, of all the norms of behavior, whether it involves hoarding, looting, attacking, and killing other people. There are many scenarios that could m turn things bad very quickly. Government systems are unable to, to, to prevent it. It doesn't matter what they say on the TV. It doesn't matter how many police you put on the streets. The scale will overwhelm them. But could the black horse of famine spread its terror on American soil as well? It may be hard to imagine, but as we'll see, when the end times are underway and the four horsemen are out of the gate, nobody will be safe. The Book of Revelation tells of four horsemen of the apocalypse heralding the end of days on Earth. The white horse represents an evil charismatic leader or antichrist. The pale horse, global disease. The black horseman of famine is charging with them, choking the world's food supply and causing societal collapse under the weight of starving desperation. But how will this nightmare scenario become a reality? The Book of Revelation holds the answer. A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Food will be so precious in those final years that a man will work an entire day just for enough to buy a little barley and enough to buy a little wheat. This prophecy of famine caused by a drastic rise in the price of food provides yet another parallel between the book of Revelation and the daily reality of our current age. Today, projections are that food grown around the world will be a record. It will be the greatest amount of food ever grown in history. But at the same time, food prices globally are still extremely high. During the global food crisis of 2005 to 2008, the price of corn and wheat tripled, while the cost of rice increased by 500%, setting off food riots in over 20 countries. While the financial collapse of 2008 slowed this trend somewhat, the next food shock may not be far away. Today, record-setting temperatures and droughts are ruining harvests in the North American heartland on an unprecedented scale. If this crucial source of corn and wheat is compromised, billions will go hungry. America will see a domino effect of economic devastation starting with its farmers. Certainly for Americans, if their crop fails, maybe they have some savings, but those savings are gonna be worth very little if the price of food jumps up, doubles, triples uh, over a few months. And if the government isn't capable of dealing with that large scale, then things go bad very, very quickly. With American crops in jeopardy and food prices at an all-time high, is this evidence of the Black Horse prophecy coming to fruition? We have global population increasing very quickly, and the demand for food over the long run is certainly likely to increase uh, very significantly in the next couple of decades. That poses a serious threat because it, in many cases, if we then have natural disasters or wars or government instability, that can really push things over the edge. With the black horse of famine charging out of the gate, Ray Gano and his family aren't taking any chances. Historically and prophetically, biblically, we know that famine is, is here. There's many places in the world that are suffering from famine. Like it or not, people are gonna start going hungry. I believe that it is Bible prophecy coming to pass. So what you can do is start preparing now and start stocking up your food. These are my long-term storage grains. 
These are all um, freeze dried. These will last about 25 years. Eventually, our food stores are going to run out. So we are going to have to know how to, to garden. We're going to have to know how to raise livestock. We're going to have to know how to, to harvest the wild edibles from the land. These are all good skills that you need to learn. This is one of our fresh water sources. This is actually spring fed. We have, we have turtles, frogs, uh, bass, perch. We have a food and water source all right here. When Noah was told by God that a flood was coming, he began that preparation process. And so when the flood came, all those people that told him he was crazy perished. And he, he got on the ark. And, and that's kind of what modern day, we equate modern day prepping to be. By preparing, by building your ark, is your own family's insurance. And so your food, your food preps, your medical preps, your everyday preps is your ark. If you've done everything you can, and having done all, then the rest is up to God. If the book of Revelation is truly prophetic, the world of our future will be sick, hungry, and extremely vulnerable. But the ultimate end of days scenario is still to come, one that promises fire, brimstone, and hell on earth. The Battle of Armageddon. This war to end all wars is ushered in by the rider on a horse the color of blood. The Red Horse of the Apocalypse. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Armageddon represents the final conflict between Christ and Antichrist, uh, the final war between good and, and evil. The book of Revelation foretells four horsemen who will bring God's final judgment upon our world. The white horse of the Antichrist, the pale horse of pestilence, the black horse of famine, and the red horse of war. The appearance of the rider on the red horse promises to pit mankind in a crossfire between the forces of good and evil in the Battle of Armageddon. But where and how will this war of biblical proportions begin? In the War of Armageddon, there is called the War of Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are nations uh, who are hostile to uh, the saints of Christ who at the time are dwelling in the beloved city, the city of Jerusalem. The key players in the war of Gog and Magog, it talks about Russia and it talks about Persia, which is modern day Iran and Syria. And it is literally Satan mobilizing the armies of Russia and Iran and these Middle Eastern nations to come against Israel in an attempt to destroy them in the last days. This vision of future conflict in the Middle East, predicted in the Bible a millennium ago, proves eerily accurate today. Russia and Iran, they're already military and scientific partners and business partners. The Red Horseman foretells that with Russia and Iran aligned, humanity will be thrown into a gruesome global war. The signs of this conflict are already visible today. Armageddon, I mean, here we are, approximately 150,000 troops surrounding the Middle East. We are on the very edge of World War III in the Middle East. What could easily happen is Russia and Iran get together and they decide to invade Israel along with some other Middle Eastern nations. And then you have all the U.S. military ships in the Strait of Hormuz. You have Israel with its powerful nuclear weaponry and computer-guided missile systems. So w with the slightest adjustment of geopolitical circumstances, every peace is in place for World War III. And World War III in the last days becomes Armageddon.
Armageddon, this holy battle between good and evil. But what exactly is to be expected when the Red Horseman of War wreaks havoc on our world? Picture all the armies of the Earth converging on Jerusalem, launching nukes and ICBMs. This is the conflict. It'll end the world and it'll never be repeated again. While some may be skeptical of the end times foretold by the Book of Revelation, the threat of nuclear doom is far from fantasy. A thermal nuclear threat, a thermal nuclear disaster, a cataclysm just over the horizon, uh, it's, it's possible, it's probable these end time events could happen. There is a real risk of nuclear war. People think that risk has gone away with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. It hasn't. The risk now is as bad as it has ever been. We came very close, dangerously close to the brink with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now people have taken their eye off the ball. Everyone thinks that danger has gone away. Well, it's just moved. It's gone somewhere else. The potential trigger points for a nuclear holocaust include, of course, Iran. Iran seems to be desperate to get the bomb. Israel and America may act militarily to stop Iran getting the bomb, and that itself could trigger war. Nine countries around the world currently have nuclear weapons. And according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the fastest growing arsenal is in politically unstable Pakistan. The new danger is from rogue states and terrorist organizations wanting to get the bomb. You've got countries like India and Pakistan, neighbors who hate each other, uh, nuclear armed. You've got terrorist groups desperate to get their hands on a weapon. All this makes the world a much more dangerous place than it was in the days of the, the Cold War, when ironically, mutually assured destruction probably kept us from war. In 2012, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists set their doomsday clock, a symbolic barometer of our proximity to nuclear destruction, at five minutes to midnight, bringing the global war foretold by the Book of Revelation perilously close to becoming reality. It's very easy to talk about um, a small exchange of nuclear weapons, but in reality, once the first one goes off, there's going to be a chain reaction, and all the constraints are going to go out of the window. If such weapons were put to use today, the initial blast would be the least of our worries. The after effects of nuclear Armageddon would be catastrophic and long term. If a nuclear war were to break out, it's easy to see that civilization as we know it, would come to an end. A nuclear war, if it doesn't uh, destroy everyone, will send us back a couple of thousand years and would take thousands of years to recover. In the aftermath of a nuclear holocaust, there are some who would seek refuge in long-term survival shelters, but they would only be confirming the prophecy of the Red Horseman. What's interesting is that when you read the book of Revelation, it talks about how the wealthy and the elite are hiding in the caves and in underground bases. And if you look at whether it's Russia and their evil mountain, as it's called, or all the vast military underground bases in the United States and throughout the world, our military and our elite are ready at a moment's notice, should World War III or Armageddon erupt, to, to protect themselves in massive underground bases. While the privileged few with access to military bunkers may feel protected, the horrid truth is that if the Book of Revelation comes to pass, no one will be safe. Is the world as we know it rapidly approaching its expiration date? Some believe the Book of Revelation is merely an allegory that bears little relevance to modern times. Others, like Ray Gano, see current events as confirmation of the book's prophecies and are preparing to face the divine fury of God himself. The world is in need for a major wake-up call, and not a day goes by where 
on the front page of every, any newspaper that is not something biblical in perspective taking place. Events are getting closer and closer and harder and harder and more severe and more painful and Bible prophecy is coming to fruition right before our eyes. People have forgotten a lot of this because a lot of people just don't read the Bible anymore. And yet it's right there in black and white, right in front of our face. And, and so we shouldn't be surprised that events are taking place in today's world because scripture already told us that it would happen. You have a chance still to prepare and be ready for the coming storm. And that's what you need to be doing. With the specter of world war looming over the Middle East, the potential for global plague hiding behind every unchecked sneeze, and famine at an all-time high, the parallels between current events and the Book of Revelation could send a shiver down even the strongest skeptic's spine. Should these modern trends lead to a cataclysmic event, be it biblical or otherwise, Ray Gano is prepared to face it. Are you? Casey, Joseph Smith, St. Malachi, Isaac Newton, Webbot, five prophets of doom separated by centuries, but united by a shared vision of terror. There would be destruction, there will be plagues, there will be wars. And what you find is an accuracy, I would say, that exceeds 80%. That got me fascinated. And as science brings the truth of their visions to light, the tectonic plates are all going to move. We're experiencing more earthquakes now and in regions where they don't typically happen. We can't predict where or when the next big one's going to strike. People around the globe are preparing for a catastrophic future. I think there's a lot to be afraid of today. According to these prophets of doom, we are fast approaching the end. Civilization as we know it will be finished. That's going to happen. This is Countdown to Apocalypse. most of us think of prophets and prophecy, our minds conjure images of Nostradamus, whose visions of catastrophe have an unsettling tendency to come true. But the great French prophet of the Middle Ages was not alone in the annals of doomsday prophecy. He is joined by a man of the 20th century, a rural farm boy who first gained acclaim for his psychic visions and later for his uncanny prophecies predicting a disastrous end for the country he called home. Edgar Cayce is probably the most famous American psychic, and it began for him when he was a young child. Born in 1877, to a family of farmers in rural Kentucky. Edgar Casey's beginnings were humble, but it became clear early on that he had a gift. He allegedly began having visions as a child where he saw his deceased grandfather's spirit. He claimed to have spirits that he communicated with. He showed unusual abilities. He had communication with uh, angels and spirits that most people didn't see. Despite his knack for the supernatural, Casey led a simple life, working with his father as an insurance salesman. But everything changed when he was asked to put his psychic abilities to good use. In the little town in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, where he was born, there was a doctor there who had heard about Edgar Casey's ability, so he asked Edgar for some help, and he started to give these health readings, and Edgar was able to visually see the person as though he had x-ray eyes, and the word spread, 
And then eventually, uh, it ended up in a New York newspaper calling him a psychic diagnostician. Once word spread of Casey's ability to divine cures for illness and injury, people flocked to him in droves. And not just for medical readings, but also for his visions of the future. As his fame grew, very important people were seeking him out. And he was being asked to privately give readings for some of them. He was even brought into the back door of the White House to give some readings. People started to realize that he was quite good and his uh, prophecies were uh, coming true. Casey's psychic counsel was sought by some of the most influential men of his time, including Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Edison, and Nelson Rockefeller, who learned that Casey's second sight allowed him not just to determine what would happen in the future, but when. Why I consider Edgar Casey one of the great prophets. Casey was a master of one of the hardest disciplines in prophecy, and that's dating a prediction. Followers of Edgar Casey believed that he predicted the stock market crash that led to the Great Depression. He had warned that the financial uh, structures of the world were in a volatile situation, even though everyone externally saw them as making money everywhere. He described to a businessman, you better get out of the stock market before 1929. The stock market crash was 1929. He also predicted war. Followers of Edgar Cayce believed that he saw the rise of Hitler. He actually prophesied that the whole world was going to go to war soon. And it turned out that was the prophecy of World War II. Years before World War II began, Cayce spoke the following prophetic words. This will make for the taking of sides by various groups or countries or governments. This will be indicated by the Austrians, Germans, and later the Japanese joining in their influence, for these will gradually make for a growing of animosities. When war erupted in Europe, people asked him, will America get into the war? He said, 41. We'll be in the war in 41. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor happened. Casey was able to accurately foresee what would become the deadliest war in human history. But he had even more earth-shaking visions of our future, involving a geological upheaval of our planet. Probably the most famous prophecies of Edgar Casey have to deal with earth changes, in which he declared we're going to go through a period of time in which the tectonic plates are all going to move and the planet's going to change. A repositioning of the globe's tectonic plates would have a devastating effect on our civilization. And much to Casey's dismay, he foresaw the brunt of this cataclysm falling on his own homeland. Casey did see a lot of cataclysms in the United States. Like our modern day seismologist, Edgar Casey back in the 20s and 30s foresaw the movement of the Pacific plate against the North American plate and that major changes would occur on the West Coast. So he saw dramatic earth changes. The visions of Edgar Casey are for just a radical um, reordering of our geography. California is basically going to break off into the ocean and be gone. He said you would have 1,000 mile an hour tidal waves that are 1,000 feet high, at least. The west coast would go all the way into Nebraska. The Gulf of Mexico is going to move inland quite a ways. He also saw new land rising off the east coast. Florida will be underwater. The areas of Georgia and some areas, even Japan, would nearly all sink into the ocean, as would a lot of South Pacific regions. It may be difficult to imagine a prophecy of this scale coming to pass, but violent geological change has occurred before. The Earth that we see now has been shaped by earthquakes and forces going back millions of years. 
We know geologically in the past there have been major changes on Earth, climatic, volcanic, earthquakes. So we can't predict where or when the next big one's gonna strike. While the timing of the next major earthquake may be difficult to predict, Casey believed devastating Earth changes were right around the corner, and evidence suggests he may have been right. You've had the 8.8 .8 earthquake in Bio Bio, Chile, and that was 188 days after massive earthquakes in Fiji. And then we had the earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. You then had the earthquakes in Japan. Earthquake activity is ramping up. At the same time, there's not just earthquakes on land, but of course, underwater earthquakes, earthquakes in the oceans, which can cause tsunamis. And we've had recent incidents of that. This trend of increasing earthquake activity is as unsettling as it is undeniable. And if Casey's nightmare comes true, these tectonic terrors will lead to a further calamity that will tear the world apart, a radical shifting of the Earth's poles. Edgar Cayce, uh, he saw pole shifts, the axis pole of the Earth. If it gets to a pole shift in terms of physical pole shift, that's when the, literally the geographic poles of the Earth change. Magnetic pole shift is a natural geological phenomenon in which the magnetic poles of the Earth slowly migrate. But if Casey's prophecy comes true, it promises something much more troublesome, a full pole reversal in which the North and South Poles actually switch place. That takes some major work. Nothing is gonna be standing. Any structure we see today, buildings, roads, uh, any of that would be just completely destroyed. Civilization as we know it will be finished. Should this doomsday prophecy come to pass, Hugh Vale, president of the American Preppers Network, will be ready. He has a detailed survival strategy in place for whatever disaster comes our way. Today, he's heading north to work on his bug-out location, an off-the-grid safe house designed to provide refuge for his family in case the world as we know it comes to an end. I'm heading to the bug-out location right now, and this is a place for us to have a safe haven. It's a place for our families um, to be able to ensure that we can give them peace and comfort in uh, potential times of disaster. As the president of the American Preppers Network, I'm privy to the concerns of the prepper movement as a whole from a bird's eye view. And what we're seeing is a tremendous uh, concerns. Bug out locations. When it doesn't make sense to a family, it's simply a family that has not been fully aware of the potential disasters that could happen and the disasters that have happened. It should be safe here. This is all peaches and apricots and chicken. I think there's a lot to be afraid of today. I think the solution with all that we have to be afraid of is to prepare. High in the Rocky Mountains, Prepper Hugh Vale is overseeing the construction of his bug out location, designed to keep him and his family safe from an apocalyptic disaster. The range of scenarios that would uh, cause any one of our families to end up here could be something as terrible as a super volcano, all the way to a total economic collapse, anything that could potentially happen. But there may be more to Vale's presence in the Rockies than meets the eye. In fact, it may be evidence that another prophet of doom's vision is coming to pass, one in which the United States is ravaged by corruption, wickedness, and war. Joseph Smith is a very colorful character. He's known as the founder of the Mormon religion. 
for many people who follow that faith, he is their final prophet of Christianity. Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon Church, a religion that counts nearly 14 million members today. To his followers, Smith was more than just a charismatic preacher. He was a modern day apostle who received visions of the future from God himself. Joseph Smith had a mystical experience with an angel, Moroni, that allowed him to prophesy and see into the future. He kind of earned a reputation as a seer. He gave many prophecies. And his greatest prophecy is the white horse prophecy. Joseph Smith's white horse prophecy predicts America will be driven to the brink of destruction by a corrupted government. He said, You will see the Constitution of the United States almost destroyed. It will hang like a thread as fine as a silk fiber. Although Joseph Smith gave his prophecy over 150 years ago, many feel his prediction of a government that has lost its constitutional core may already be coming true. It describes in many words and ways what's happening in America right now, a broken government that can't legislate, uh, a court that becomes politically active rather than constitutionally active. Smith also predicted a collapse of American values as the government decays. The prophecy continues. A terrible revolution will take place in the land of America, such as never been seen before. For the land will be left without a supreme government, and every species of wickedness will be practiced rampantly in the land. In this prophecy, Joseph Smith saw it all occurring during a time of wickedness. Some of the most dire parts of the White Horse prophecy talk about a complete breakdown of society in America as a result of the government society not functioning, people lost in their selfishness, which seems to be permeating the American society and a kind of a complete breakdown of the basic Christian fundamentals of life. And I must say, other prophecies share a parallel vision. Jesus spoke of it in the Olivet Discourse. He said that the love of many would grow cold, that brother would turn against brother. And, and I think we do see those things increasing. Edgar Casey also predicted class warfare, racial warfare. Liberty, yes. Tyranny, no. Nationalism would be a problem, racism would be a problem, and class struggle which we're living in right now. The wealthier are getting wealthier and the poorer are poorer. You almost feel what Joseph Smith was seeing occurring before our eyes right now. And he talks about how a lot of the true and faithful seeing this will all migrate into the Rocky Mountains. And perhaps that this group would be the ones that, that save the nation and they are called the White Horse. And in the spirit of Joseph Smith's prophecy, Hugh Vale and his network of preppers have gathered here in this same mountain range to weather the political storm they see looming on the horizon. A lot of you are already storing food and water. There are hundreds of thousands and now into the millions of, of families that are doing this because they're feeling something. I believe that there are some very trying times going on right now. I believe that the difficulties that we see are an epidemic that is working through our homes and our communities and ultimately our country. Thanks, Hugh Vale's concern about the state of America echoes the prophecy of Joseph Smith. And if Smith's vision is truly being realized, we are about to experience a civil war that will tear the country apart. Associated with this white horse prophecy and the loss of the Constitution is this sense of an incredible battle going on in the U.S. for the morals, the original ideals of America. Tea, anyone? No. <laughs> tea. And this 
battle is so intense, it polarizes into two groups that just can no longer uh, endure one another. Father will be against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. The most terrible scenes of bloodshed, murder, and rape that have ever been imagined or looked upon will take place. The Civil War coming is not going to be against the North and the South. It's going to be state versus state, city versus city, family versus family, complete breakdown of society. And when you've got a country with 300 million guns in its citizenry, the most well-armed citizenry in the world, this kind of a civil war is quite possible. The American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 saw a death toll of 750,000. But those bloody battles were fought with mortars and muskets. Today, with automatic weapons available online and at gun shows across the country, and a population nearly 10 times larger than during the Civil War era, the potential bloodshed of a modern Civil War would be colossal in comparison. Should the war foretold in Joseph Smith's prophecy come to pass, preppers like Hugh Vale are fully prepared to defend themselves by any means necessary. I think preppers, just like every family member, is required to be able to protect our family with firearms. We would never want to have to use it, but if circumstances were that we had to, and we, of course, we would use a gun if we had to. Joseph Smith prophesied that the white horse would descend from the Rocky Mountains and pull America back from the brink of collapse. And to that end, Hugh Vale has taken up arms to ensure that he survives the coming disaster to help restore the country. One of the key core uh, elements of owning a handgun and, and using a handgun as a prepper is making sure that uh, places like a bug out location, which are intended to be a safe haven, remain a safe haven. So that when we go back home, we can participate in the solution of cleaning up and restoring uh, the society and the community the way that it was. The visions of Joseph Smith and Edgar Cayce predict a disastrous future for America. But imagine a catastrophe that isn't limited to our shores. Rather, a global disaster that is nothing short of biblical. Edgar Cayce foretold of a future in which entire states fall into the sea. Joseph Smith envisioned an America stained red by the bloodshed of civil war. In the face of these tribulations, Many would seek refuge in the house of God, but ironically, it is precisely there that our next prophet of doom foresaw the origin of our obliteration. Malachi Morgare was nothing less than a saint, but despite his faith in the mercy of God, he was forced to bear witness to a terrifying vision of divine wrath a biblical apocalypse that he predicted would occur in our time. Malachi Morgare was the first Irish saint to be canonized by a pope. He was known to, to have some supernatural miracles associated with him. He's most famous now for his prophecy of the popes. In 1139, Malachi made a pilgrimage to Rome to visit the pope. While ascending one of the city's fabled seven hills, he was struck by a revelation from God. And the story goes that he fell into a trance all that night. He would mention these Latin phrases. De meditate lune, flows florum, pastor et naltua, de labora solis. Each one of these Latin phrases would match up to the reign of a particular pope. And in that vision, he saw 112 popes up until the tribulation time, till the end. And according to St. Malachi's prediction, this end time, following the reign of the 112th pope, is right around the corner. We're at 111 now. Pope Benedict XVI is 111. 
If Malachi's vision was true prophecy, there will be only one more pope to follow Benedict XVI who turned 85 in 2012. In other words, our time may be running out. But why should we believe him? Malachi didn't just predict the number of popes before the end of the world, he also predicted who they would be with startling precision. And what you find is an accuracy, I would say, that exceeds 80%, which I can tell you, that got me fascinated by these prophecies and that he's one of the greatest prophets I've ever encountered. And what makes it amazing is he gets more accurate as he gets to the end of the list. In fact, some of the ones more recently are quite astonishing. You have Benedict XV, who's called by Malachi, religio depopulata, which means religion devastated or depopulated. In his reign, the Christian faith was decimated. 25 million people dying from World War I. It's also the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And scholars say that 200 million left the Russian Orthodox Church to join the Communist Party. Religion depopulated. After him comes the papal giant, John Paul II, who is called De Laboris Solis, which means the sun's labor through eclipse. He was born in 1920 on a total eclipse. Then when he died, he was actually buried during a solar eclipse as well. Obviously, people can't manipulate eclipses, so apparently Malachi really did see a vision of the future, and it would, it, you would have to be divinely inspired, I would say, for it to, to match that accurately. That seems to be a little more than coincidence. Malachi's prophetic precision continues with the current pope, Benedict the 16th. Number 111, the final numbered motto, and that is de gloria olive, the glory of the olive, or from the glory of the olive. There is a group of Benedictines called the Olivetans. Their symbol is the olive branch. The glory of the olive would be the highest ranking among them, and there he is. We thought, Malachi's correct again, and now there's only one more pope in the line. We are very close to the end of this prophecy. Malachi's prophecy concludes with a succession of Pope Benedict by a man who will herald the end of the world. Malachi named this final Pope Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman. The prophecy for the 112th Pope is, in the extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will nourish the sheep during many tribulations. And when they are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people, the end. Now that's quite an ending, and it seems to intersect with biblical prophecy. The Malachi prophecy matches the book of Revelation in chapter 17 with the city of seven hills being judged. That being the case, it seems to me that it's predicting the events of the book of Revelation. Now, if that's true, then, then during the next Pope's reign, we will see the tribulation period predicted by the Bible. The New Testament's book of Revelation speaks of an end time tribulation period in which humanity will suffer seven years of terrible judgment. The first half of the tribulation promises the infamous four horsemen of the apocalypse who will bring the Antichrist, famine, plague, and war. But the true terror of Revelation begins with the second half of the tribulation, in which God will unleash a series of judgments known as the seven bowls of wrath. In the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, there's a quantum leap forward in the intensity of God's judgments. What happens here is you see that God's cataclysmic judgments become planetary, hellscapes, if you will. It culminates with these planetary earthquakes that literally change the topography of planet Earth. Entire 
continents are moved, cities are rearranged, the West Coast could very possibly disappear, be submerged underwater. So this is the level of judgment in the bowl judgments, total cataclysm. The events of the Seven Bowls of Wrath bear an eerie similarity to Edgar Cayce's prophecy of the Earth changes. Is this coincidence or something more? The signs of Cayce's nightmare are all around us, and St. Malachi's final pope is just around the corner. Were these prophets of doom sharing a vision of the terrifying tribulation predicted by the Book of Revelation? Another prophet of doom may provide the answers, one who also predicted that the biblical end times would occur in our era. But unlike St. Malachi, this ominous oracle was no man of the cloth. He was perhaps the greatest scientific mind in history. St. Malachi predicted that the world will end when the next pope takes the throne. Chillingly, there is another dark visionary who predicted that the biblical apocalypse would occur in our era. And while his name is familiar, his status as a doomsday prophet may be surprising. Isaac Newton is widely known as the father of modern science. He invented most of the laws of classical physics that all engineers still use to this day. But Newton's accomplishments weren't limited to the realm of science. The great scientist Sir Isaac Newton was secretly a great investigator of prophecy, a great prophet himself. As wildly heralded as Newton is for his scientific work, he probably wrote more on biblical prophecy than he did science, in fact, a lot more. And he thought, being the mathematician he was, that he could perhaps look at the book of Revelation and calculate the real end of the world. Newton obsessed over his doom equation for years until he finally calculated the answer he was searching for, the date of the apocalypse. He perceived that he had conceived the exact date of the end times, and he marked that date as 2060 AD. 2060. This ominous expiration date is mere decades away. But how did Newton determine the countdown to apocalypse would end at this time? His calculation of the year 2060 is based on the book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation's dark imagery has fascinated believers for centuries, and Newton was no exception. According to Newton, one particular story within its pages held the key to his doomsday equation. In Revelation chapters 11 and 12, a woman is chased through the desert by a red dragon. There's no doubt about what the dragon symbol means in the Book of Revelation. It's a symbol for Satan. Newton believed this passage represents a period in which the true faith would be persecuted by the forces of Satan and the Antichrist. As the tale continues, the fleeing woman escapes the dragon and hides within a place prepared by God that there she might be taken care of for 1260 days. So he took those 1260 days and made them years. Newton had calculated the length of his countdown. All that remained was to determine when it should begin. Newton held that the papacy really represented the Antichrist system. So he saw the papacy as the enemy of the gospel. Now, he saw the, the rise of the papal system around 800 AD. So he simply added those 1260 years to the 800 date and put that up to 2060. Newton's doomsday equation seems simple enough. The end days will begin 1260 years after the formation of the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy's rise to world power. 
But some historians today argue that Newton's biblical apocalypse may come even sooner. There's been some word going around that Newton had miscalculated the birth of the Holy Roman Empire, which throws this whole count of 2060 off. Other scholars would start that date at 752 to 756 AD, based on the time that the papacy acquired the papal states in Italy. Now, if you put the 1260 years on to the 752 date, you land in the year 2012. Did Newton miscalculate the start of his countdown to the apocalypse? Are we entering the end times now? Experts suggest we are, and as evidence, they point to two events that Newton predicted would occur in the lead up to doomsday. You know, there's specific milestones that he uses for the count. He predicted that the Jews would return to their homeland. We saw the Jewish state come in 1948, and then the Six-Day War, they reclaimed Jerusalem in 1967. Now, when he was writing, that was, was not really on the map. I mean, there were no, hardly any Jews living in Israel. They were dispersed around the whole world. Newton also predicted the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon, a holy Jewish site that has been demolished twice before but that Newton believed would be constructed a third time in the last days before the apocalypse. Well, just as recently as 2009, a group of Israelis took a, a big cornerstone and laid it on the Temple Mount and said, this is the cornerstone of the third temple. That is uh, set off alarms in a lot of prophetic interpretation. With the cornerstone in place, Newton's prediction of a reconstructed temple may not be far off, and by extension, neither is the end of days on Earth. The fact that Newton wrote about it and that we see these things falling into place today is a little chilling. Whether the cataclysmic date is 2060, 2012, or perhaps something in between, Newton's apocalypse is drawing near. That would mean, that would imply that all the things we expect from that time, the apocalypse and all that would happen. It would be a time of judgment, and he, he believed that there would be destruction, there will be plagues, there will be wars. There are cataclysms. So, I mean, those judgments are scary. Edgar Cayce's Earth Changes. St. Malachi's prophecy of the popes, Isaac Newton's end times equation. These prophecies tell us that an imminent end is coming to our world. The prophets of doom foresee that our world is teetering on the brink of disaster. But to truly understand the bleak future before us, we must turn to a product of modern times, one who is neither man of faith nor man of science. In fact, our final prophet of doom isn't human at all. In 1997, Computer consultant Cliff High and his associate George Yor created a software program designed to predict stock market trends. But then, something unexpected happened. The program began predicting real world events. And when those predictions came true, High and Yor realized they had created something far more profound than they had intended. They called their creation WebBot. So the way the WebBot works is it's surveying what people are talking about and, and what's being written on the internet, and it's, it's gathering all this data. The developers of it claim that it, it's picking up the, the unconscious mood of the world. Their theory is that what people are thinking or putting out is somehow a presage of what's coming. Is it possible we are subconsciously in tune with future events? The creators of WebBot believe we are. And as evidence, they point to the fact that the program has predicted several global catastrophes already. One would be 
the September 11th attacks, the developers of the WebBot say that they got a lot of hits about a future event two months before September 11th. The WebBot is credited with the tsunami prediction in the Indian Ocean. And here, Edgar Casey also is credited with predicting that. It also seems to have forecasted the 2003 Northeastern blackout. And then it seems to have anticipated Hurricane Katrina in 2005. It's somehow ahead of the curve picking up what people are talking about, but it seems to be able to get a feel for the future. But WebBot's most chilling prediction is a vision of catastrophe so devastating that it can only be represented by a data gap, an ominous absence of activity following the world's most anticipated date, December 21st, 2012. Whitbot talks about there's coming time towards the end of 2012, after the mind calendar shift, into the spring of 2013, where there's a data gap. Not only does it seem to predict a cataclysm, but the data after 2012 falls off the chart, and there seems to be nothing left. What does that mean? Perhaps the end of the world? Some people think so. If WebBot is to be believed, then just as animals have a sixth sense of impending earthquakes and storms, we too have a subconscious awareness of things to come. And according to WebBot, the next great event on everyone's mind is the end of the world. In fact, Utah-based prepper Hugh Vale has noticed an alarming trend in the American Preppers Network that suggests WebBot and our other prophets of doom may have been on to something. There's a lot of people that are joining the American Preppers Network, and it's not uncommon for us to see a 10,000 or a 20,000 unique visitors coming that have never been to our network before on a daily basis. People are tremendously concerned about their own well-being. They're concerned about the well-being of their children. They're concerned that possibly the next generation is not going to grow up. Is it possible that WebBot glimpsed the end times envisioned by the prophets of doom? I empathize with, with families who are very concerned about the end of the world. Because when we, when we think about the end of the world, and there's a lot of things that could potentially bring the end of the world about, where's the motivation to go get prepared? Where's the motivation to excel when it may just come to an end? The thing that uh, is most motivating and inspirational to me to get prepared is my kids. Everything that I do is for my family. Everything that I do is for my children. Really? Throw it to me. <laughs> I have no clue what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after that or the year after that. Um, one thing I do know is that regardless what happens in the future, I want to be prepared for my family and uh, make sure that their basic needs are always taken care of. Webbot. Edgar Casey, Joseph Smith, Saint Malachi, Isaac Newton. These prophets of doom predicted disaster for our times. And we may have seen the signs suggesting they may have been right. Did they truly glimpse the end of the world? And are we about to experience it? Time will tell. But preppers like Hugh Vale are not letting the grass grow under their feet. They are getting ready today for when these prophets' visions come true and the countdown to apocalypse runs out.